I perioden 1948 til 1952 mottok 16 europeiske land 13 milliarder dollar i varebistand, gaver og gunstige lån. Av dette mottok Norge omlag 460 millioner dollar. Store penger. At nettopp gjenoppbyggingen etter 2. verdenskrig er en av de største suksessfortellinger i moderne historie. Vi trenger et samlet løft for verdens fattige. Vi trenger et samlet løft for å stagge klimaendringene. Innsatser på begge disse områdene må handle om byrdefordeling. Det må handle om vilje fra de rike til å ta ledelsen. Og det må stilles krav begge veier. Det hele kan minne om hva Marshall gjorde for et halvt århundre siden. Derfor tyr vi til dette begrepet når vi tenker stort. Vi trenger en ny Marshall-plan. Det tjener til generalens ære og det bør tjene til vårt ansvar. Kjære venner, Marshall-hjelpen ble renningen i den veven som i dag knytter USA og Europa sammen historisk, verdimessig og interessemessig. Members of the Noble Committee, ladies and gentlemen, I accept this honor with profound gratitude that has been conferred upon me by the Noble Committee, and I do it not merely for myself, but more especially for the American people who alone made possible the authority and possible the funds which made the European recovery program a reality. Thank you very much. The Second World War left Europe devastated and in ruin. It was total war, total in every sense. The distinction between civilian and soldier was completely erased, and when peace arrived, things were not much better. We didn't have power, we didn't have telephone, the food was very, very poor. There was no business at all in this country. What is the sovereign remedy? We must build a kind of United States of Europe. In this way only, Will hundreds of millions of toilers be able to regain the simple joys and hopes which make life worth living? Dette er Hammerfest våren 1945. Rundt i Europa lå ruiner etter mange byer større enn denne. Bare for Norge kostet krigen 13 milliarder kroner. I need not tell you that the world situation is very serious. That must be apparent to all intelligent people. I think one difficulty is that the problem is one of such enormous complexity that the very mass of facts presented to the public by press and radio make it exceedingly difficult for the man in the street to reach a clear appraisement of the situation. That this visible destruction was probably less serious than the dislocation of the entire fabric of European economy. For the past 10 years, conditions have been highly abnormal. Certain leading personalities were to greatly influence the future of the coming decade. Joseph Stalin, Vyacheslav Molotov, Ernest Bevan, Georges Bodeau, Harry S. Truman, and perhaps most important of all, American Secretary of State George C. Marshall. George C. Marshall was born December 31, 1880. At 16, he attended the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington. 
His time there showed him to be a natural leader, and during the fourth year he was appointed first captain, the highest ranking cadet officer on campus. During World War I, he was head of operations in France for the United States First Division. In July 1918, Marshall was moved to U.S. General Headquarters and was on the planning staff for the final attack that forced Germany to the peace table and the end of the war. During World War II, Marshall was Army Chief of Staff and oversaw the victory in Europe, the Pacific, and Southeast Asia. President Truman said of Marshall, Millions of people gave this country great service. Marshall gave it victory. In 1947, Truman asked Marshall to become his Secretary of State. What was already clear to the European, the economy of Europe had ground to a shuddering halt. And Sir Oliver, now Lord Franks, described it this way. The time was short. Most of Western Europe was paralyzed. There was a great shortage of food. And food grains, wheat, uh, was not present in Western Europe in sufficient quantity to feed the people. In Italy and France, for example, by the end of 1947, the prospect was starvation unless help could come. Vanskene nådde klimax da tørken satte inn over Europa. Kornhøsten ville stå feil. Politiske interesser stengte tilførslene fra de gamle østeuropeiske kornkamre. Rasjonene ville synke, prisene gå opp. Tiden var inne for uroligheter. I ruinen Tyskland forlangte folk mat og arbeid. Krigen hadde knust industrien, ladde hadde ingenting å betale med. Tyskland var blitt et tomrom i Europas handel. Norge led også under det, fordi Tyskland var vår viktigste handelsforbindelse før krigen. I England streiket havnearbeiderne, mens landet trengte hver mann for å rette på finansene. George Marshall made his famous speech on European reconstruction. I was in Zurich in Switzerland. And for the following three, four days, I participated in a conference of representatives from 20 Labour parties. The conference had been called Reconstruction of Europe and the relations between East and West. The real birthplace of the Marshall Plan was in the Kremlin, April 1947. During General Marshall's interview with Stalin in April 1947, Stalin took so relaxed an attitude towards the failure of the recent four-power conference on Germany that it led the general to believe that the Soviet dictator was merely waiting for Europe to fall in his lap. After we left the Kremlin on the way back to the embassy that night, and following that on the airplane returning home, General Marshall kept stressing one theme, that the United States must seize the initiative and attempt to reverse the current of economic dislocation which had followed the war in Europe. As soon as Marshall came back from the extraordinarily frustrating Moscow Foreign Ministers Conference, he directed Kennan to immediately get the policy planning staff going and to write as his first operation, a paper on the problem of Europe and its future. America was left virtually untouched by enemy bombs. Our strength as a nation today is greater than ever. But powerful as we are, we dare not allow ourselves the luxury of feeling secure. In this age of the atomic bomb, no single nation can be secure until the whole world is committed to a way of international life that outlaws war. 
It behooves us then to understand the post-war problems of other nations and how they affect the welfare of the world as a whole. It is already evident that before the United States government can proceed much further in its efforts to alleviate the situation and help start the European world on its way to recovery, there must be some agreement among the countries of Europe as to the requirements of the situation and the part those countries themselves will take in order to give a proper effect. One place where the speech did not go unnoticed was in 10 Downing Street. Ernest Bevan immediately recognized the significance. I remember well the deep feeling with which I heard over the wireless Mr. Marshall's great speech. It was a speech from one continent to another saying, in fact, get together, put up your plan, and we will try to carry it out. Mr. Bevin told me uh, that when he heard the speech on the BBC, he at once saw that the United States was going to be interested after the war in Europe and in its recovery. And he therefore, immediately and without any pause at all, got into touch with the French foreign minister, at that time, Monsieur Bido, to make arrangements for making that response uh, from Western Europe. Two years after the war, Hammerfest in the north of Norway was slowly recovering. However, it was far from back to normal. The war had more or less eliminated Norway's ability to export goods to foreign markets. Industrial equipment was outdated and the output was well below the 1939 level. To compete, Norway needed to modernize its industrial facilities and equipment, which had to be acquired from abroad but there was no capital to invest in modern machinery. Norway is a, almost a paradigm of what the problem is in Europe. Things have been recovering fairly well, but it can't continue unless there is an infusion of money temporarily to prevent uh, the shortfall in imports and consumer goods and investment. Landen i Europa førte stort sett samme politikk. Kontrollen vokste etter hvert som valutabeholdningen minket. Det som kunne eksporteres ble solgt til den som kunne skaffe viktige varer i bytte. Det ble lite igjen til dem som trengte det mest. The newspapers, not Marshall, call the Marshall Plan. But it's not really a plan, it's an idea that the United States must participate, it must spend some money, and that the Europeans must get organized and tell us what it is they want. What to do was worked out in the negotiations, first between the Europeans and the Americans, and then in between the Americans. And the Americans initially pushed planning very strongly, that is, coordination of European uh, investment plans, of their national planning, to make Europe into a more of, more of a European economy rather than a number of separate economies. The first meeting between the European countries to discuss the Marshall Plan was held in Paris, July 10, 1947. The challenges for a successful recovery effort were many. The tension between East and West Europe had been building since May 1945. By the summer of 1947, there was no agreement between the Allies and the Soviet Union on Germany and Austria. Secretary of State George C. Marshall, in an extemporaneous extension of his testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, underlines the need for full cooperation with communist menaced countries seeking aid from America under the European Relief Program. I think it is of the greatest importance that in considering uh, this program the people as well as the Congress thoroughly understand the critical world situation. We've had the comment several times that uh, 
We won a victory, but we still have not won a peace. It goes much further than that. In some portions of the world, there is more fighting now than there was during the war. You are aware of that. There is a political instability. There is, uh, there are efforts to almost change the face of Europe, certainly as we understand and desire, contrary to the interests of mankind in the advancing civilization. Averill Harriman, who was a special representative of the Marshall Plan in Europe, remembers the next development. The Marshall Plan was not just for Western Europe. The proposal of General Marshall was all of Europe, Russia, Eastern Europe, as well as Western Europe. For once, the Russians were in a hurry. Normally, it takes weeks, you know, to, <laughs> to start negotiations and to have negotiations fulfilled. Molotov came, and with him were 89 experts. Stalin had taken the invitation. Stalin wanted dollars. På denne bakgrunn møttes den engelske, russiske og franske utenriksministeren i Paris. Men motsetningene var for store. Utenriksminister Molotov forlot møtet. Men han kunne ikke hindre at alle vesteuropeiske land ble invitert til å diskutere en felles gjenreising med amerikansk hjelp. Molotov stalled at the meeting of foreign ministers on participation in the Marshall Plan. They needed the aid to rebuild. On the other hand, they did not want to indicate just how weak they were. Because they anticipated a, a challenge with the West just as much as the West anticipated a challenge with the East. Um, and that challenge, of course, was Berlin. That's where it flared up. In reality, they were probably more worried about the influence that the plan would have on the Eastern European countries and that they would lose control of them. We were uh, some sort of hit by uh, a new euphoria because uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, they fought so bravely against the Germans. So we looked upon them for quite a time after the peace broke off, to put it that way, uh, as uh, allied, as friends, as people that we should uh, not only trust, but uh, also praise. But then again, um, very, very shortly, people realized that they were uh, political imperialists. On October 5th, the communist delegates released a formal communique disdaining the Truman Marshall Plan as only a farce, a European branch of the general world plan of political expansion being realized by the United States of America in all parts of the world. The foreign ministers, Molotov, Bevan, Bideau and Marshall, met one last time in November and December 1947. But they departed with no solution for an all-German government under Allied control and an eventual peace treaty. The Marshall Plan initiative kicked off a political and economic process that would last for many years to come. This government had no intention of entering into bilateral negotiations with the Soviet government on matters relating to the interests of other governments. Norway and the Scandinavian countries had a tradition in foreign policy of political bridge building and neutrality, even if the country had been leaning towards alliances with England and the West since its independence in 1905. All the Scandinavians eventually decided to join the Marshall Plan, though they were the most reluctant to establish supranational or close international cooperation within the Marshall Plan organization, but they still moved to a more cooperative stance by late August, early September, and increasingly so 
towards the time of the coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948. In early March 1948, the coup by the Communist Party of the Czech government in Czechoslovakia, with the evident backing of the Soviet Union, was to influence the events in Western Europe and make the approval of the Marshall Plan easier in Congress and among the 16 European countries. That was a shock. I can really say that was a day that shook the world because Czechoslovakia had been pictured as the idyllic democratic country where the communists, the social democrats and liberal forces could work together in peace. The same day as they took over in Prague, the Finnish government got a note from Stalin where he invited to a pact of friendship and common defense. Rumors came to Norway. We would get the same invitation. Minister of Defense went to England. Are you prepared to help us? And then again, Bebbing is acting. Bebbing writes a letter to Marshall and says, before Norway goes under, we must act. Then there are no discussions anymore amongst Norwegians as to whether we should participate in the Marshall Plan or uh, bridge building or anything like that. He found fram till a plan that was laid fram for the national forsamlinger. All fick flertal for forslaget. Bare 11 of Norges 150 stortingsmen stemte mot plan. Sixteen nations responded to the invitation of Mr. Bevan and Monsieur Bido. Enemy and friend and neutral, they sent their representatives to examine their mutual problems, discuss how best they could be solved, and painfully sometimes come to an agreement on how much and what kind of help they required. Austria was there and neutral Portugal, all three Scandinavian countries plus Iceland, what was to become known as Benelux, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands the Truman Doctrine countries, Greece and Turkey, Ireland and its neighbor, the United Kingdom, Switzerland and its neighbor, France. This was the Committee of European Economic Cooperation, the CEEC, and Sir Oliver Franks was its chairman. The essential purpose uh, of the work we were doing in Paris was a longer-term plan for European recovery. But we couldn't ignore that in the short term, uh, there was a direct problem of enabling life to go on. This wasn't a question of reconstruction of plant, reconstruction of bridges and railroads. Uh, this was simply a question of food to eat, to live. And this had to be dealt with in advance of the rest, because a long-term recovery program wouldn't have made any sense at all if the people weren't there to recover. Many congressmen were very leery when President Truman said, we need $597 million in emergency aid for France, Italy, and Austria. People in Congress said, look, you, we just gave you $400 million for Greece and Turkey. Uh, are you going to come back every few months and ask for bigger and bigger chunks of taxpayer money? Now, it was not an easy thing to sell. As of December 1947, his aide in Washington said, we think that the Marshall Plan legislation in Congress has only a 50-50 chance of passing. So there's a tendency for people to say, oh, well, the Marshall Plan worked so brilliantly, it must have been an easy thing. Uh, not originally. On Thursday, January 8, 1948, Secretary of State George C. Marshall took the witness seat in the Senate caucus room before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 
to open hearings on the proposed European recovery plan. Secretary of State Marshall, in placing the plan before Congress, stated, Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. The six and eight tenth billion proposed for the first 15 months is less than a single month's charge of the war. To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. It is a difficult program. And you know far better than I do the political difficulties involved in this program. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. The abrupt collapse of Czech President Edvard Benesch's coalition government came as no surprise in official Washington. In a top-secret briefing of the cabinet the previous November, Marshall had warned that the Soviets would eventually clamp down completely on Czechoslovakia since a coalition government in the nation could too easily become a means of entry of democratic forces into Eastern Europe. All 16 European countries were now ready to join the Americans in Paris and received the funds. However, in early March 1948, Congress had not approved the plan. George Marshall and President Truman were ready to use the political crisis in Europe following the coup in Czechoslovakia. Harry Truman wrote his daughter Margaret, things look bad. The director of the Army Intelligence and the commanding general of the armed forces in Germany, Lucius Clay, cabled Washington. I have felt a subtle change in Soviet attitude which I cannot define, but which now gives me a feeling that war may come with dramatic suddenness. Truman. Will Russia move first? Marshall counseled caution, but admitted, This is a world keg of dynamite. Harry should not start it. On March 10th, Admiral Louis Denfeld suggested that the American people be prepared for war. Four days later, the Joint Chiefs of Staff provided a hastily drawn war plan to counter a Soviet attack on Western Europe and the Middle East. That same day, Truman's speechwriters were preparing an address to Congress on the European Recovery Plan. The President was determined to take advantage of the crisis to ask Congress to quickly adopt the Marshall Plan. A sense of urgency raced in Washington. Senator Vanderburg made an appeal to the packed Senate and concluded, it is a plan for peace, stability, and freedom. As such, it involves a clear self-interest for the United States. It can be the turning point in history for 100 years to come. If it fails, we have done our final best. If we succeed, our children and our children's children will call us blessed. After two weeks of debate, the Senate voted 69 to 17 to approve the program in essentially the form Marshall had requested. On March 31st, the full House shouted the bill through in a voice vote. The American Senate bevilged 17 milliarder dollars, and we took that nearly every dollar would be a gift from the American folk, without that there would be no bond on the countries' foreign policy or foreign policy. They just had one condition, cooperation. With the tradition of using several pens, President Truman signs the bill that puts into effect the Marshall Plan plus aid to China. The program to aid free nations against red aggression becomes a law. The signing of this act is a momentous occasion in the world's quest for enduring peace. This measure is America's answer to the challenge facing the free world today. Alt ble satt inn på å yte en hurtig og effektiv assistanse. Den alminnelige amerikanske kvinne og mann gjorde sitt beste for å dele fredens vansker med sine europeiske venner, som de også hadde delt krigens byrder med. De sendte ikke bare av sin overflod, men varer de selv trengte og hadde lite av. Norge fikk sin andel av alt dette. This was a watershed in European history, and I think uh, it's really necessary to praise those Americans. Of course, George Marshall, President Truman, George Kennan was a part of it, and Clayton was also involved. So there were many Americans, not only Marshall. The organization will be not part of the regular government. The State Department will not run the Marshall Plan. 
Marshall appointed capable businessmen to be in charge, Averill Harriman in Europe, and Paul Hoffman running the operation from Washington, D.C. He was a, uh, um, a brilliant businessman, and he ran it like a business. I mean, it may have been, in a sense, if you will, the first global uh, corporation, if I can use that phrase, spanned nations, continents, etc. And uh, there was no hint of scandal. It's interesting, you know, there was no hint of, of graft, corruption, siphoning off funds. This was not Iraq. Paris is centrum for the European Samarbeide. Here has Norge's fast stab, som blir ledet av en minister. Hans opgave er å holde regjeringen underrettet om de andre deltagerlandenes stilling og å legge fram våre synspunkter. Thus, Norway can export fish. Also lumber and forest byproducts. She needs ships and other supplies. Sweden, though bearing no scars of the war and having a well-balanced economy, must nevertheless export and import to keep her economy balanced. The Marshall Plan makes the necessary credit available to move such stabilizing trade. The American Marshall Plan mission had sometimes daily meetings with the Minister of Trade, the uh, Minister of Finance, uh, and with the Norwegian top-level bureaucrats. Uh, and they discussed in detail Norwegian economic policy, reconstruction policies how to industrialize. Now, after the war, Norway was still not a developing country, but certainly less industrialized than a number, number of its, its neighbors. It is a part of the plan to develop knowledge and ideas. Therefore, will technicians from Europa every year be invited to study American production, which is the most effective in the world. It is important to learn each other's failures and opportunities to the best possible. And some of these experts, when they left Norway, and the plan was the uh, Marshall Plan came to an end in 52. They wrote, uh, wrote books about Norwegian economy, the way how the plan was actually done and so forth. It's never been a cooperation closer between Norwegians and Americans. In the summer of 1948, there was still no political solution to Germany or Austria. Germany was divided in four zones. The Allied zone was controlled by the Americans, the French and the British. Berlin was divided into four zones, but was effectively an island inside the Russian zone. Berlin would be a conflict area for decades to come. The German economy must be resurrected in order to help the rest of Europe save itself. Which is made more acute by the fact that Germany's breadbasket, her agricultural area, is cut off from her industrial area by an iron curtain. Until the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union come to agreement about the fundamentals of a German peace treaty, such as boundaries, reparations, and the political and economic structure of the future Germany, there can be no overall European recovery soundly enough balanced to ensure peace. In Austria, the Soviet Union's exorbitant reparations demands have so far deadlocked all negotiations for a treaty. A treaty would give the Austrian government the necessary power and freedom to unify the country and take part effectively in a European recovery program. Meanwhile, Austria remains economically crippled. Now, the Russians are very suspicious that the British and the Americans are planning to use the Germans uh, as a foil against them. And the more the British and the Americans try to do positively in Germany, the more negative it looks to the Russians. And finally, in the spring, of 1948, the Russians begin trying to apply a little pressure to warn the Americans and the British not to go too far. The German currency isn't worth anything. The, the standard of currency in much of Germany, at least in the cities, is the cigarette uh, or the nylon stocking. 
The currency being worth nothing inhibits the recovery of Germany and as the engine driving European economy. So the idea is let's change the currency, let's make it into something that people want, that has value. To the Russians, that's pretty much the last straw, that this looks to them like they're setting up a separate state in the West that'll be hostile to them. Uh, and so they begin putting more and more pressure on, and the one pressure point that they have is the access to Berlin. There are three major ways of getting to Berlin, railroad, road, and air. And the two chief ways, of course, are railroad and autobahn. And those run through the Soviet zone. And the Americans and the British were unable at the end of World War II to negotiate a clear entry into Berlin. They did manage to negotiate clear lines of entry by air, but not by ground. And so the Soviets, who feel that time is running out on them, that the Americans and the British are getting together with the Germans and dreadful things will occur, tried to put pressure on the Americans and the British by closing these landlines. In June 1948, the Western Allies announced plans to establish a separate West German state. On June 18th, a new currency, the Deutschmark, was announced. The problematic Reichmark was withdrawn. On June 23rd, the Soviet authorities responded by issuing a new East German mark. The following day, the Western military government of Berlin blocked Soviet efforts to extend the new Eastern Zone currency to West Berlin. The blockade of Berlin lasted until May 1949. Darunter bestes Weizenmehl kommt in die westlichen Sektoren und die Bäcker machen Überstunden, um alles verarbeiten zu können. Was man für unmöglich gehalten hatte, wurde Wirklichkeit. Zweieinhalb Millionen Menschen werden sozusagen per Luftpost verpflegt und ebenso wie das Brot sieht die gesamte Ernährungslage von Tag zu Tag heller aus. Dunkler dagegen ist die Situation auf der anderen Seite des Brandenburger Tores. The success in the Berlin Airlift really is a propaganda success rather than a Russian material failure. The reasons why the communist uh, Europe and the Soviet Empire uh, went to hell was that was basically economically and socially. So that's a very interesting difference between uh, East and West. The Americans were so pragmatic that they even could accept a planned economy uh, as long as the basics of a free market economy was very, very clear. Today, even um, people on the most leftish side understand that uh, uh, something must pay off and that, that profit is good. They didn't understand that uh, some 50 years ago, but they do today. The Berlin crisis had three significant outcomes. It led directly to the creation of two German states. It committed the United States to a significant military presence in Europe for the indefinite future. And it led to a reappraisal of Western military calculations. However, it was the commercial development that was impressive. Britain was producing cars again, and a waiting list was several months for the average consumer. Belgium received machinery for road construction from the Marshall Aid Program. One objective was to increase internal communications between the countries in Central Europe. France received equipment for oil drilling and soon became the center of export to neighboring countries. In West Germany, new modern machinery boosted the output in the coal mines of the Ruhr area. It soon exceeded the 1939 level. Germany was once again a driving force in commercial Europe. Denmark installed new modern equipment for its textile industry, financed by Marshall Aid Capital. And the interesting thing is that Norway got, actually, Norway got more than any other country compared to uh, the population. And um, this is interesting because that was exactly the help we needed to help 
ourselves. That was something which gave a great push to the rebuilding of Norway and the further economic expansion, which has ended in what we can say today. Well, thanks God, we got oil, gas, and we have everything. So now we are a very rich nation. If we hadn't got the Marshall Plan from 48 to 52, I wouldn't be sure, I would not at all be sure that Norway would have been such a wealthy and rich country today, because that laid the background, and the background was laid thanks to George Marshall and the generous Americans. As the Marshall Plan evolved and the European countries prospered, Marshall could take special pride in a program that he had proposed at Harvard, defended before congressional committees, and helped sell to various groups and regions of the country by appealing for American unity in a movement that served American interest by aiding Western Europe to survive. The Nobel Peace Prize in 1953 would honor his achievement. The period uh, between January of 1947 and January of 1949, the years in which Marshall served as Secretary of State. Now ponder this, what a remarkable transition. The Army Chief of Staff, who has acquired enormous knowledge of the affairs of the world, turns from arduous years of war making to perhaps even more challenging years of peacemaking. It takes an enormous human being to have that kind of range. General Sandkonst satte pressefotografen i arbeid, men også mange andre var møtt frem for å få et glimt av den berømte statsmannen før han reiser til den amerikanske ambassaden der han skal bo under oppholdet. One of the telling moments is that he accepted the Nobel Prize but he declined to accept the financial award. This was, of course, largely applauded in Europe and the United States and elsewhere, but there were also critics, people who thought that the Nobel Prize ought not to go to someone who had spent the large part of his professional life as a soldier. And when he was invited to step forward to receive the medal, a group of demonstrators in the gallery began to shout, murderer. I have the honor. Communists. Before they could be escorted out of the hall, a tall, dignified figure in the front of the hall stood up, turned toward Marshall, and began to applaud. And at that, the rest of the gathering stood and applauded. The tall, dignified figure was none other than King Hokon VII. And then he went on to name three essential elements of a durable peace. First, he thought that children ought to study history. They ought to learn the story of the human family and how to make use of it. Second, he called for exchange programs in which people could live in other people's nations and learn to understand one another. And third, he called for programs to assist developing nations. Out of the past, out of the wreckage and rubble, a new and prosperous Berlin is rising. Industrial production was 40% ahead of 1938, and agricultural production was 20% ahead. 
And if you ever want a, a dramatic demonstration of how important psychological attitudes are, you have it in these figures. In other words, the moment that the Europeans saw something to look forward to, some hope, the response was immediate, and uh, everyone went to work with a new spirit, a new drive. And it was the Europeans who were responsible, because we mustn't forget that out of the 100% effort that went into speeding recovery in Western Europe, 95% was on the part of Europeans. Our 5% was vital, but it was 5%. The Marshall Plan was a success, an unqualified success. It completed its work earlier by six months than was scheduled and cheaper by several thousand million dollars than was budgeted. In less than four years, Europe had not only worked itself out of the despair of 1947, but had increased its industrial output far beyond its pre-war capacity. Nothing like it had ever been seen in the history of the world. The price tag on this miracle was modest, as miracles go. About $80 for every man, woman, and child in the United States, close to $12,000 million. A wonderful and exciting chapter in European history came to a close. After the uh, enactment of the Marshall Plan, uh, Norwegian school children uh, gathered money together for a gift to General Marshall. They sent him a Norwegian elk hound as a gesture of thanks. And uh, General Marshall named that fine beast NATO. This is the world's northernmost town. Hammerfest in the land of the midnight sun. It has been completely rebuilt since the war, and life has almost returned to normal. No, I went on ski in the winter 1941, after that Frankrike was taken. We were occupied by the rain and snow. America comes, America comes. Oh, they were them. They were them. They were their name. We do not regard a strong and united Europe as a rival, but a partner. We believe that a united Europe will be capable of playing a greater role in the common defense and burdensome tasks of building and defending a community of free nations. <laughs>